Uh, Your Eminence, Archbishop Angelus, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us with SAT7 as the Archbishop of the Coptic Orthodox Church in London and also as the chair of our executive board, SAT7 Executive Board and International Council. Rita, it's uh, lovely to be with you and um, such a blessing. And uh, I, it's wonderful that at a time of this sort of lockdown that we can still be in communication, contact with each other. So it is wonderful to share this time with you. So good to see you. I hope I'll see you in person soon in London. I miss traveling a little bit. <laughs> yes, what, what, traveling? What does that mean? I can't remember what that means. <laughs> Your Eminence, you, you, you knew before that we had a big conference in Turkey in March, and it's um, where all the Sat7 partners, friends, supporters gather together, and uh, we just present Sat7 work. And the theme of the conference was daring to believe. So can you talk to us a little bit about this challenge of daring to believe, especially in this time of unprecedented crisis? Yes, we, we were supposed to be together, uh, and I'm, I'm so sad that we're not, because it's a wonderful time to catch up with friends from around the world and people who are so committed to the work of SAT7, as well as the SAT7 team from all over the world. Um, but no one, no one could have foreseen what, what we're going through. And if, if belief and daring to believe was important when this was being planned, it is infinitely more important now. Hmm. Because at the moment, um, we're so overtaken by news and statistics and science and expectation and anxiety. We're all looking for answers. And the frustrating thing is that many of the questions we have actually don't have uh, conclusive answers at the stage and, and you know it's really easy to be um, uh, judgmental of of uh, policy makers and scientists and people in in authority because we're talking about which way we're going what decisions we're making and of course there are very clearly right and wrong decisions in some things but with many things we don't know uh, the most the most expert of experts don't know. And so we come back to holding on to what we really know, which is our faith, Amen. which is that we are in the hands of a, a, a mighty God who is loving and daring to believe in that is really important. It's very easy to fall into the mindset of why has God allowed this? Why is God uh, doing this to the world? Is this judgment of the world? So many scenarios play out, and they are the easy ones to fall into. But the more daring ones are believing that we're in the hands of, of a God who, um, like a child who sees a parent doing something that they can't explain, realizes then that it was just either the parent going on with, with his or her daily life or for their own benefit or that good things will come out of every situation. And so the daring is holding on to what we believe in. And I do think as Christians, we have an incredibly important role at the moment. It's not to be delusional. To, it's not always to be smiling because people don't want to see that. People, people don't want to be reminded that, that somebody else is happy when they're not. Yeah. Um, but I think what's important is to show people that there is hope that in the scheme of things, this is a horrible situation. It's unprecedented in our lifetimes. No one alive today has gone through this or anything like it. No one, not a single person has gone through this. And so there are a lot of unknowns, but also as Christians, we can show that hope that we will come through this. And of course, there will be people who will still have very sadly lost loved ones or, or become sick or become uh, anxious or, or afraid or lose income or lose stability. But there is still hope beyond all of that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And by God's grace, we will rebuild and we will get back, not even to where we were, but I'm sure in many ways, a better place. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, what is what is the role of the church today? I, I know that you talked a little bit about the role of the church, and I'll tell you why I'm asking this, because we broadcasted a lot of programs, you know, like this time, uh, on all our channels, Arabic and uh, Turk and Pars. And we got a lot of questions about where is God when it hurts, or really God is a God of love, or is it a punishment, or is it the end of you know, days? And as you said, we don't have the answers, but a lot of people ask this question, maybe they're Christian or non-Christians. So what is our role to address these issues without, as you said, giving them a false hope? Because we have the faith, not a lot of people maybe understand what is faith. You know, maybe they're not church goers. So what is our role? you know, today to address all these very difficult questions? The role of the church as defined by the one who established the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, is to preach the gospel to every creature. That is one. Uh, and, and please don't misunderstand me. By preaching, I, I don't mean actually going out and speaking because we don't all have that remit. And for some of us, it's much better if we don't. <laughs> because the, the message is sometimes you know, not exactly what we need. But in that, in that we live the scripture and present the scripture and give the scriptures. But also, one of my favorite passages in scripture is Acts 1.8. Uh, and as we are approaching uh, Pentecost, whether it's you know, during uh, the, the Western calendar or the Julian calendar, uh, our Lord says to them, they will receive power from on high when the Holy Spirit descends upon them, and they will witness to him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And I think that is the role of the church. Um, first and foremost, our role is Jerusalem. So it is our own faithful. It is looking after them, especially at, time, at times of, of challenge like this. And I think we do need to give our people hope and understanding that they're not alone, that the church is there for them. The church is not just an institution, but an extension of themselves and their families. Um, you know, a lot of services have shifted online. Uh, we, we were very blessed, I think, to have seen things coming and preemptively before the, the, the lockdown, we had moved all of our services online from all the way from, uh, early Sunday school to Bible studies, church board meetings, and even our liturgical services. So I think it's important for the church to look after its own at the moment. But then in doing that, it also looks after Judea, which is the rest of the body of Christ, um, the rest of the people who, who believe, but maybe, as you say, have not been believing for a long time, have not been attending, have not been there for whatever reason. And then we go to, to Samaria, and they're not necessarily people who are our enemies, but people who are different. People who need that witness, people who need that sense of hope and presence in a gracious way, in a practical way. Um, I, I was speaking with, uh, I think in my sermon last week, about what it means to be the light of the world. And as Christians, we throw this expression around very easily, be light. What does it mean? And I suppose that what I was focusing on is light breaks darkness. Mm -hmm. So what is the darkness we need to break? Is the darkness of fear we need to, to give reassurance? Is the darkness of, of um, bereavement and a loss of loved ones, we need to give comfort. Is the darkness sickness? We need to pray for healing and help where we can. Is the darkness poverty? You know, because a lot of people are suffering financially, economically out of this. Then we need to provide um, graciously and, and with generosity, whether it's through contributions or through going out and doing various bits of uh, social work where we can, where we're allowed to. So I think that's being light 
whether it's in Samaria and then to the ends of the earth yes. with everything we can do forever. And right, I really do think we need to break down our mission into bite-sized um, tangible steps that mean things to people now. Mm. Um, you're talking about social work and I remember like three, four years ago when we met by accident on the plane, you were so passionate about you work among refugees, and I and you told me that you you traveled around. You went to Lebanon and other parts of you know Egypt and other parts of the Middle East. You know, just um, helping you know refugees. What about refugees today? What about people who are suffering, who don't have the means of social distance, who don't uh, you know like have the luxury of uh, washing hands or um, using um, sanitizer? What do we tell these people today, and how can we help them? I was speaking to um, to some medics this morning, mm. and of course we see the pandemic breaking out everywhere. But it is it's baffling that in some of the most vulnerable places, as you say, where there are those challenges, it doesn't seem to be as aggressive. So, and we and no one knows why. No one knows why because when you look at population, when you look at the volume of people, uh, there are some places that have no hope of social distancing. It just thought it won't work. When you're living in a shanty town where you're sharing a, a shack with 15 other people, um, when you are living in poverty in a slum area where you're having to do things like go to, to get water from a well or various other things, um, where you're living in, in, a, in a refugee camp, where you cannot isolate or distance. These are incredible challenges. Mm. And while, as I said, I think our role must be Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, thankfully, we don't need to do it in that order because the church now has capacity to multitask. Mm. So we can do, as long as we're not ignoring any of them, we might be able to do them in parallel. Mm. So while we're looking after our communities, we should have our eye on refugee communities, on vulnerable communities, on impoverished communities, on communities that are struggling with socioeconomic uh, challenges at the moment. Are you Even active at the Coptic Orthodox Church, active, you know, uh, with the plea of refugees or people who are suffering in the region? or this coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, just prevent you now to, re to resume all activities and help? So, for instance, um, if, if I look at our experience here, um, we're doing all we can to look after our community, but we, we have an, a social work arm of the church mm. called Exodus, and that is working in the community and has been working from day one. Uh, it, it, um, it's providing uh, meals, provisions, assistance to the broader community, not even, so Exodus isn't even working within the Coptic community. It's working outside the Coptic community mm. and it's doing, doing great work. Um, our, we have a homeless ministry. It's been running here for 20 years. We're having to do things differently at the moment. Mm. But we're still trying to do as much as we can because there are still people um, on the streets. Uh, in terms of my own advocacy work, although many things are shut down, we're doing, we're still doing our advocacy work, keeping our eye on vulnerable communities. Um, I've just had a, a, a conference seminar a couple of days ago where I was speaking about uh, this mm -hmm. kind of issue. Where we need to continue looking at freedom of religion or belief we need to look at advocacy for those who are persecuted for their faith and so on and so forth. So I, I do think we, we, we have to keep our eye on everything at the same time. And by God's grace, we now have capacity to do that. Yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm drawn to the words of our Lord, where you ought to have done one without leaving the other undone. Mm. Mm. So I, and I think there is definitely space for that. I would like to ask you now a personal question. So people who are, you know, watching, they will get to know you better. 
what is the one lesson, just one lesson that you personally have learned because of the lockdown and isolation? I mean, I don't think you were isolated. You were still active, you know, in the, the community and at church. But if you would like to share just one lesson that you have learned, what will be this lesson? So, I mean, I don't think I've been, and I, it's such a shame that we've used this word isolation, because of course I've, I've been here at our church center for the last two months, two months plus, mm -hmm. haven't been moving around. Um, but yes, I'm still engaged. We're engaged online, we're interacting with people, we're, we're doing what we can. Um, so this, this term isolation is very, it's very, um, yeah. I will, I will tell you why I use this yeah. term. After no, no, but I mean, it's a term we're all using and it, it's, yes. it's a shame that the agenda was set so early that we're using the term isolation because I think I, I always say, although we are geographically apart, we should never feel isolated. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but for me, I think, um, I have always, always been inspired by the story of Nehemiah. Um, it, it's always been something that's really been on my mind, um, whether it's in just leadership generally or in collaboration. I, I love collaboration. I love bringing people together. I love working with others. And it's, it's the concept of us complementing and completing each other. And um, it's, it's the, his, his resolve saying that uh, the Lord of heaven will prosper us so we, our servants, shall arise and build. And thank God we are not building from ruins, but we are building against mm. challenge and against restriction and against limitation, and against obstacles. And so again, you know, in, in my own diocese, uh, what I've done is set up these um, response groups. We have a medical response group, we have a diocesan response group, we have a group that deals with the digital platforms as well as the parishes, as well as a squad within each parish that's helping vulnerable people by delivering things and giving assistance and making sure they're set up on digital platforms. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, Nehemiah is building the wall and he realizes he can't build it all together, each household is building the bit of the wall in front of it. And they all connect together and it becomes a wall for everybody. And so what I've learned and what I've seen uh, is, is, you know, incredible people working. And I, I give thanks for them every day. Uh, I give thanks for their dedication, their commitment. And that's just my account in my church. I'm sure this is happening in every church around the world, where this has given great opportunity for people who may not have done things to actually do things. Uh, for us to build new capacity, to build relationships, to build community. And it, it's interesting that while we are isolated by distance, some communities have actually become tighter and stronger. Mm. And so what I've, what I've learned is that uh, the church is resilient and the church is strong and the church is alive. And just finally, um, I always reflect that in, in, in the early church, when they couldn't gather and pray, they all went down into the catacombs. When we now can't gather and pray, we've all gone up into the World Wide Web. And we've been able to gather and continue our ministry differently, but still, still important. And that's why I'm using the, the word, you know, like the term isolation, because I'll tell you why. And then I will come back to your point of, you know, like, uh, going and praying in, in safe places uh, under the ground or uh, you know whatever the term is uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago no more than than one month when we celebrated Easter here in Cyprus and Easter here in Cyprus is really big it's just like you know festivals and food and people going to mass and uh, and going out and so you know like the celebrations so Cyprus is a you know a Orthodox community it's the biggest you know like a community of the Orthodox Church here with some you know like other um, uh, other denominations and a colleague of mine said it's very weird in Sat7 Cyprus he said he's very it's very weird you know that this is the first time we don't celebrate 
Easter. We don't go to, to mass, we don't go to church, we don't celebrate, we don't hear like the church bells. But Rita, it's the first time that I feel what does it mean to be an isolated Christian in countries like maybe Iran or North Africa or other countries. So this is my question to you today. I mean, now we, we felt what, what does it mean to be isolated as Christians? We cannot go you know, to church because of the COVID-19. And now when everything like goes well, and like actually today we can go back to church and we can go, back, go to restaurants and go back to work, there's still people who can't do that, not because of COVID-19, because of many factors. So can you just elaborate a little bit about, you know, like on this, uh, especially with um, a lot of uh, isolated Christian celebrating uh, masses and prayers behind closed windows, behind closed doors, underground, isolated. It's, it's given us all a very new perspective. Um, start with Christians. Christians who were able to go to churches but just didn't. They were busy, they were lazy, they were preoccupied. Uh, it's too early, it's too far, it's uh, too inconvenient, it's too long, it's too short. Lots of things. And now people are saying, actually, it was such a blessing, I, I can't wait to go back. And so I think in English there's, a, there's an expression that says familiarity breeds contempt. So when we become familiar with something, we don't really respect it as much. Mm. And, and I do think so for Christians, for, for us, many people have now found the value of being in community, in church, physically with each other. No, no, it's a difficult community, it's problematic, they talk about each other, you know, I don't want to be there, it's better to be away. No, it goes across our communities and across humanity. But sometimes we use that and decide not, not to go. So I think that's one thing. It's also given a perspective to those who are in countries where there is no restriction on prayer, what it means to not be able to go to church. Mm. Um, many people would, nev would never have had that experience. And while they may have spoken about, you know, Christians in different parts of the world who are suffering or struggling because they can't go to church, now it, it means something very different because they've felt that pain. I was speaking to a, a, an, an Anglican friend last night who was really struggling with the fact that he couldn't take communion because the Church of England churches here had actually been closed mm. for, uh, for the past, you know, two and a half months. Um, and so it, it, people are suddenly realizing that there is such a price that is paid daily by others who for whom this has become part of life. And I think there's an appreciation. I hope that once we come out of this lockdown, and as humans, we have a tendency to revert to type. So we're very excited now. We go back, we're all going to be very dedicated. I hope that it's not in a, manner of, in a matter of weeks or months that we just go back to where we were and forget. The second thing I think for us, as Coptic Orthodox Christians and other communities, you know, we have developed quite the reputation for having churches bombed or Christians attacked and then going back into those churches the following day to pray. There are some incredible pictures of churches uh, in Menya and across Upper Egypt where it's a burned shell, but people are praying there the following day. Uh, and so our understanding of resilience has always been get back there. Whereas for us to not be able to go to church and our resilience, meaning that out of a sense of social responsibility and stewardship, we must stay at home and not go anywhere. That's a totally different concept and it's very new. So again, it's a very different perspective of what it means to be resilient and what it means to be responsive in the right way at the right time. So I think we're all learning and we're all going to get different perspectives. I just hope very much 
that once all of this is over, and it will be. Sorry, I don't understand. Um, Sorry, this is uh, <laughs> Google. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and while things may be different, um, I hope that we go back to remembering what we've learned at this time. Amen. Amen. I love uh, <laughs> your positive spirit. I think it's uplifting your eminence. Uh, I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit and talk about Sat 7. So as you know, if I'm going to talk only about the Christian Arabic channel in the region, there are like 34, 35, maybe 36 uh, Christian channels. So what does make Sat 7 unique? I know like every channel has its uniqueness, but to be the chair of our executive board and international council, and to be part of this journey that started with the founder and president Terry Askett and now with me. So what, you know, like what, um, what does inspire you to be part of uh, Sat7? Well, Rita, you know that my journey with Sat7 started before Sat7 was Sat7. Um, <laughs> I, in, in, in the early 90s, I was serving uh, I was a monk in the monastery of St. Bishoy, and I was serving as the private secretary to the late Pope Shenouda, the head of our church. Mm. And um, it was then that, you know, Terry had come to meet his holiness and float this idea of this satellite channel uh, that was going to be established. And so I knew about it then, and it was really inspiring. And... Uh, you know, ever since that day, I've known Terry well and, and his family, and I've known the work of Sat7. Um, and it's been interesting and actually quite encouraging seeing the vision mm. becoming a reality and for it to grow. Um, and then in you know, more recent history, um, I was accosted, I mean, sorry, I was approached by uh, Terry and a certain lady who was on his team to become the, um, the chair of the board. Well, first of all, it was to become a member of the board, <laughs> which quite quickly es escalated into becoming the chair of the board. Um, and as much as I tried to resist, it didn't really work out very well. You are a blessing. You should know that. Okay, continue. <laughs> but but, but I, I think, you know, it was a blessing. And I really felt it was the right thing to do. Mm. Although, you know, th there were time constraints and, and, and I didn't know whether it was the right person uh, to, to, to add what needed to be added. Um, genuinely, I felt it was the right thing to do because I feel Set7 is a broadcaster. Um, and, and, you know, Rita, I've said this to you and I've said to the board that while many people now are grappling with this COVID-19 situation um, and learning how to communicate in a different way, this has been Sat7's bread and butter mm. for a quarter of a decade, a quarter of a century. Mm. Um, and so Sat7 has suddenly become even more relevant mm. in this current setting. Um, I also, what I appreciate about Sat7 is that it, it is genuinely ecumenical in its makeup, uh, whether it's board or it's council. Um, and, and you know that there have been concerns in the past over the programming that there wasn't enough uh, traditional content, whether it's Orthodox or Catholic. Um, I, I do believe that you know, we want to work to make it much more global in a Christian context. And I do think it is trying to do that now. Mm. Um, and, and it is genuinely ecumenical. I mean, other, other than the Middle East Council of Churches, I think Sat7 is doing a wonderful role of bringing churches together and Christians together and presenting this model of of gracious Christianity, where we understand one another's differences, but we also journey together mm. as much as we can. Um, understanding that things do separate us, mm. but 
you know, going back to our common our terminology of isolation, we don't need to be isolated. And we learn, we need to learn to appreciate one another as we are, not trying to make ourselves something different. Thank you for being part of that seven family, your eminence. It means a lot to us. Okay, just maybe like two final questions. One, one is what do you say? And I think I'm leading you to tell the story uh, or what you have shared in our set seven US board. What do you tell people today that are afraid? Maybe they're resuming work, going to church, uh, going to the beach now that the weather is really nice, but they're still afraid, uh, even though they, you know, with social distance, et cetera, et cetera, but still generally afraid. So what do you tell them? First and foremost, we, we, we should not be afraid, but we should be wise and we should be responsible. Um, we do need to be careful. Uh, sometimes the notion of Christian resilience um, almost plays out as being careless and haphazard. And uh, our faith is translated into recklessness. No, God will protect me. God will not protect you if you go out and make yourself vulnerable. And I heard it vulnerable. many times, actually. Yeah. It, it, to, to a disease, to an illness, to a virus, that's not faith. Mm. That's recklessness. That is, that is irresponsibility. Mm. And so I think we, we, we do need to realize that, yes, we don't have to be afraid. We should not be afraid, but we should be cautious and responsible. Um, the second thing is um, to discriminate between to discern between what is in my hands and what is not in my hands mm. what i can control and do and what i just need to be part of and, and see how it works out so there are so many new experiences and nuances through this whole um, covid 19 world we're living in that none of us know how to deal with and we have not been part of in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, live life as normally as you can based on the restrictions and guidance where you are, because it's obviously different in different countries and in even different parts of countries. Mm. So uh, we need to be careful. And, and one thing Rita, I've, I've constantly made, um, very clear to the people serving with me is that we can look at guidelines in two ways. We can either look at them as um, guidelines that are there for our safety, thought out to be implemented, and we need to be socially responsible and carry them out to the best of our ability in good conscience with faithfulness. Or, as with many cultures, we can see them as an obstacle we have to work around. <laughs> or find a loophole in. Especially and that, the least. <laughs> and it doesn't help anyone. No. That doesn't help anyone. And, and, you know, for many Christians who are living in persecution, they have had to navigate around obstacles, and it becomes part of their DNA. Mm. And so it's understandable that might be the mindset. But I've also, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful, you know, I've seen our own church that has had that experience uh, in Egypt from His Holiness the Pope all the way through the, the clergy and the laity being very responsible and realizing that we have a, a Christian responsibility of stewardship over the world. So, so we need to be careful of that and we need to be real, really realize that our Lord was very clear in the world we will have tribulation but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so there is tribulation, there are struggles, there are challenges, there are obstacles. Um, but God willing, we will, we will come through them um, as, as much as, as we can. And I suppose what you're leading me to is another issue that I have huge concern about. <clears throat> 
right at the beginning, and I think it's eased off a little bit now, but unfortunately, right at the beginning, when people were most anxious, people were most afraid, people were most vulnerable, there was lots of preaching about this being God's wrath and God teaching the world and God punishing the I world. I still hear it, you know, like many times, especially with guests, and I'm telling you, you know, like with all honesty, that we have on Set 7 screen. And I have to interfere, personally say, please, you know, like just focus on God's love and mercy now. It's not the time. So please tell the story because you have great insights regarding this issue. So everyone is completely entitled to his or her perception of scripture. And of course, we all have our experiences with God and we all receive messages in different ways. Um, but I have trouble with the concept of people trying to psychoanalyze God. You know, why is he doing this? And I can also understand people saying, well, it might be because of X, Y, or Z. Mm. But my problem is when people come and categorically say, no, God is doing this for this reason. No one has that perception. No one has that answer. No one has that, no one has that, that insight mm. to categorically say why God is doing anything. So I think that's very important. And it's, it's something I've learned in preaching to never try to explain why God does things but explain my perception of why I think God does things, which is different. So in my mind, um, I, I cannot, with a clear conscience, accept that this is God punishing the world. Uh, I, we have no proof of that. It might be the case, but I, I will, you know, we give, we say that we give people the benefit of the doubt. And, and we say that people are innocent and are proven guilty. So I don't want to accuse God of punishing the world without any sort of conclusive evidence. And I don't think that's right. Um, so yes, there are perceptions. And what thing, one thing we can do is say, you know what, going through this, I've realized my life needs to be different and take it as a personal message, but never impose that burden on others. Never say, You've lived a bad life. The world is a sinful place. God is just clearing up house. Um, I just personally have a problem with that. And the account that comes to mind for me is the um, Gospel of St. Mark when our Lord is in the boat with his disciples and he's asleep in the back and there is a great storm and the disciples run to him and wake him and they accuse him straight away saying, do you not care that we're perishing straight away? And we're not told that our Lord responds, but he gets up, um, he commands, he rebukes, he calms the waves, he silences the sea. And then the next thing we read is, and there was a great calm. So what our Lord did, is he saw them frantic, he saw them upset, he saw them afraid, he saw them anxious. These are, these are fishermen on a boat. And so they understand the danger of the sea. And he took that into, into his mind. And after he calms the sea, he turns to them and says, why do you have such little faith? I love this. <laughs> we are now in the storm. Mm -hmm. Our role as Christians, as parents, as people in responsibility, as leaders, our, our role now is to calm people's anxiety. Our, our role now is to address people's fears. I love this. And then, when the time is over, many, many months, years down the line, let's take people to task for what they have and haven't done. But, but for now, our primary role is to comfort and be comforted that, that our Lord is in our boat and he will not let us drown and there will be a great calm. Mm. 
Yeah, it's very well put, uh, Your Eminence, and I think this is the role of the church today. I can listen <laughs> to you for hours, but as we say in Arabic, but I think we need to stop now, but final words. Sorry, can I add one thing? Yes, that's why I want like final words. Anna, just so my last message isn't misunderstood. Yes. There is place for the church to say what is right and what is wrong, to teach, to direct, to correct. That is, right. that is undeniable. But my point is how it's done and when it's done. Amen. And it, in what setting and context it is done. That's really important for us. Amen to that. Amen to that. Okay, final word. Maybe there's something that you wanted me to ask and I didn't ask, or maybe a word for Set7 partners, friends, Set7 employees. Final thing, final prayer, a verse. I, I think finally, I just, again, just want to echo what we've been saying. Um, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer does not deny the fact that we will be tested in the world and our resilience will be tested, that we will face tribulation, uh, that we will face hardship, uh, that we will face pain. That, that doesn't change. But I, I do think that um, we need to be both the vessels of, but also the recipients of hope. Mm. Um, and it shouldn't be a false hope because false preaching is very transparent. Um, it becomes hollow words. And so I do think we, we, we need to be very clear that we have to understand the hope that is in us and be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us. And at the same time, to be able to, at this time, grieve with those who are grieving, comfort those who are sick or anxious or afraid, help those who are in need in whatever way, and be that vessel of light and of hope in the world as we live it today, knowing, knowing that this will pass. And once it does, um, we will, by God's grace, be reunited. And the church will look the same in some respects and different in others, but that's still okay because the body of Christ must be alive and responsive. Mm -hmm. And so it does it does develop and it does change in the way it does things and presents the, the message of God. But be of good cheer. Amen. Thank you, Your Eminence, Archbishop Angelus, for being with us today. You have to know that we love you very much and we pray for you. God bless you. Rita, it's a blessing to be with you. Please uh, give my regards to the whole team and blessings to all of your viewers and blessings uh, upon you uh, I'm not sure when this is going out, but it's going around around Pentecost, whichever Pentecost date you are going to uh, celebrate. Um, be assured that the Holy Spirit who descended upon the apostles and empowered them is the Holy Spirit who is alive in the church today. And um, that is our reassurance and our comfort. So God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.